Springtime is the best time to visit Vegas, get the best deals. And if you want the best deals, you got to go to Vegas.com. Whenever I travel to Vegas, I want a cheap room. I want to make sure I'm staying someplace that's nice, cool, comfortable, maybe lavish. You know how you do that? Vegas.com. Spring break, March Madness, NASCAR clubs, EDM events. It's all happening in the springtime. You got to go to Vegas.com with this exclusive offer. Check this out. $84 off at the Bellagio, $56 off at the Luxor, $90 off at Caesars, $100 off Cirque du Soleil. Everybody knows insiders get the best deals. You got to go to Vegas.com. Vegas.com's proprietary drop watch tool promises the lowest rates on hotels. Drop watch continues to monitor the price even after you book, and then it will notify you of the change to ensure that you get the best deal. Vegas.com. Vegas.com offers the best rates on not just hotels, but also headliner shows, tours, attractions, VIP, bottle service at top clubs. Go to Vegas.com right now. Click on the microphone in the top right corner and enter my code MORE, M-O-H-R, to receive an extra 10% off everything but air hotel packages. That's Vegas.com. Click on the microphone and get your bonus savings by using my secret code MORE, M-O-H-R. Vegas.com. The code is MORE. Book today. When shopping for car insurance, consider this. GEICO has been saving people money on car insurance for over 75 years. So if you're serious about savings, it's simple. Go to GEICO.com. After 75 years, they know how to save you money. Put your name on it. Just put your name on it. That's all I say. Be a man or a woman. Put your name on it. Well, I'd like to hear about it, potheads. How the fuck you gonna know how to be great if you don't study greatness? Look at the game change. Donuts. If you want a battle, it's either that you will say yes or no. You know, you're not a bad looking man, Mr. Gals. But you are, Blanche. You are in that chair. There's something wrong with us. Something very, very wrong with us. Hey, man! Hey, let's tell fart jokes. <laughs> Are we good? Are we rolling? How about a sound check from uh, Pastor Rob Bell? I'm here in the garage. Sound good. Really happy to be here. Here we go. At real Rob Bell. Not fake Rob Bell. Real Rob Bell. You know you've made it when there are parody accounts yes. of you. Like there's no like, uh, hey, well, there is actually a Jay Moore 36. So I take that back. They just started my parody accounts. Oh, yeah, but, they just started. <laughs> but you're big time, man. I mean, you've been on Oprah. That's where I saw you first on Super Soul Sunday with uh, Oprah and Pastor Rob Bell and Oprah getting down talking about uh, the Lord Almighty. Now, this is where, Rob Bell, before I'm going to let you jump in here, I got to let the <laughs> listeners know, because here's what happens. I'll have an athlete on, like Ray Mancini or Forrest Griffin, and then people will email me after the fact. You don't have to give those disclaimers, JJ, because I, it, that, those are the ones I like the most, the things that I didn't think I was going to like. I'm not like into sports at all. Um, let's say you're an atheist right now, and you're already going, no, no, hold on a second. There is so many stories within this story. You don't have to be uh, a pastor or a Christian like myself. This is a really great story that uh, Pastor Rob Bell brings to the table. And <laughs> Rob Bell's looking at me like, what, what is this story? <laughs> I'm looking forward all, to hearing it. <laughs> kudos on playing in punk bands. That's, I think that's a good leaping off point. Yeah, that's how I got my start. I think that's badass. I, if, I mean, if you're going to be a front man... Yeah. As Christ was. <laughs> I mean, listen, let's be honest. He wasn't playing keyboards off to the side. Right. You know, that's no Guitar basis. on a strap. That's no Sven from the Black Crows. That, I mean, that's Chris Robinson way up front. Way know? up front. Yeah. With the mic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what did you play? Did you play guitar? You played guitar, right? First band in college, I was the lead singer. Front man. And it was all about every person from the front to the back. Like, here, we, here we're going to go somewhere right now in the next hour. So... Yeah, that's how I that's how I started out was bands and hauling amps and stuff around and putting up signs all over town before the gig. That was when you the say gig. you started out. You mean just started out with just life, not started out in a ministry. No, like in co no, it was college. 
It was in college that I was in my first band, and then yeah. there was a whole string of bands from there. Yeah. Who's your favorite uh, front man of all time? Peter Garrett, Midnight Oil. Oh my God! How can we dance when our earth is turning? How can we sleep while our beds are burning? How can we continue this podcast after that horseshit answer? <laughs> what? Midnight Oil. It's horrible. You could have said Mick Jagger. You have you said ever seen Freddie them live? Mercury. Have you ever seen them live? No. Okay, I rest my case. He's like six. Seven? Who cares? Six, They're eight. horrible. How can we, he sounds like Audrey Hepburn. Oh, how can we sleep? I think you just offended all of Australia right now. By the way, <laughs> dum dum. That is the most MTV schlocky band of all time. You, could, you had Mick Jagger, Eddie Vedder, Bono. You had you had Freddie Mercury. You had Robert Plant. You know the guy from Midnight Oil. Absolutely. What kind of ministry are you running? 1988. A bald one? Downtown Chicago, the Aragon Ballroom, the Diesel you and You could have went Robin tour. Sander if you want to go Chicago. You could have said Billy Corgan, Chicago. No way. No I will way. stand by Peter Garrett. All right. I will book, defend that one the whole way through. The book that you wrote with your wife is uh, Zim Zum of Love. Uh, and you wrote that with your wife, uh, Kristen? Yeah. Now... I've been reading a lot of things of people that have read this book, and they're saying everyone about to get married has to read Zim Zum of Love. Uh, we put this together in about four days. I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> Tell me. I'm honest. What, is, what, is, what code did you crack with Zim Zum of Love that all of a sudden people are running to the bookstores before they get married to read your book and your wife's book about getting married? Um. Well, first off, we were pretty, Chris and I are pretty cynical about marriage books. They always seem pretty cheesy to us. So three steps to this, four methods to that, whatever. We were always like, is, we didn't know of any marriage books. Maybe we just haven't seen that much that weren't a little bit like, come on. And what had happened is we've been married for 20 years, and I had stumbled somewhere across this ancient word, zimzum, which was, you would love this. This was um, ancient rabbis, like, 600 years ago, roughly, they had all these fascinating um, sort of discussions and commentary on the world. And they said, before there was anything, there was only the divine. It's very esoteric sort of stuff. And they said, before there's anything, there's only the divine. So if the divine is going to create something that's not the divine, the divine has to create space for something to exist that's not God. And so God has to essentially contract or withdraw to create this space. And they said that, that uh, the ancient word for that was zimzum. And Zim Kristen Zim. and I were laughing. Zimzum like, is the space? Zimzum is this, you or contract in order to create space for another being to thrive. And um, I had sort of stumbled out on reading something, and I said to her, check out this word that I came across. It, it's like what happens when you meet somebody. Because it's just you. You have your life, your work, your friends, and everything, your center of gravity. Then you meet this person, and you start to sort of fall for them. And suddenly you find yourself like arranging your life around them. How can you see them more? And then you find yourself actually making sacrifices for their well-being. And it just sort of happens gradually over time. You essentially make space in your life for another person to thrive while they're doing the same thing for you. And, and then what give that, space. And then what that does is it creates like this sort of space between you, like this energetic flow between you. We never heard of someone talk about a relationship like that. That's pretty cool. So we ended up sitting side by side for a year and a half writing this book together because there are ways that this flow of love and the space, things that can block it, things that can increase it. And what is the uh, number one thing, Pastor Rob Bell, that blocks the space? <laughs> I'm serious. What, I love it how you keep the, saying Pastor Rob Bell. Well, it's, so it's, uh, you know, it's the old radio trick. You know, you got new listeners every 11 minutes. You got to reset <laughs> who you're talking to. But I do get, I get tweets from people like, we know who the guest is. It says it on the app. <laughs> Uh, what's the biggest thing that blocks the zimzum when you're creating space and you have space and you have to give space as well? I would assume that you have to give space for your partner if they need a little time. Yeah, or like space sometimes or there's not enough space between you. The one person gets lost in the other. You know, this person helps this person achieve all their creative goals, and in the process, their life is sort of lost. So sometimes it's almost like there's not enough space. Sometimes you reach you living your own lives. You have your own friends, your own work, and you sort of drift apart. So part of it is just. Always asking, how's the space? Is the, how's the distance between us? How's the space? What's going on in the space? Is there anybody in the space who shouldn't be in here? Like so, that. The, so the biggest obstacle or blockage would be the lack of communication about this space itself? Endless, like, it's like an endless conversation. It's like marriage is like, or a long-term relationship is like you never stop talking. And what we discovered is when we would see people who'd been together for a while and they actually seem to have something really 
amazing that you'd, you'd want to emulate. And we would ask them, like, what's the secret? They'd always say, there is none. The only thing is, is you never stop figuring it out. I, I've, I'm very happily married. Like, and I'm, uh, here, I, I did a podcast. No, it was a radio show. Monsignor, uh, uh, Monsignor Jim Lasante out of New York City. And he was asking me about my wife because I've been very open about my wife and stuff like that and how much I love her. And she actually changed my life. Like the Zim Zum there was, for some reason when I met her, I it just, the show, I didn't have to put on a show anymore. Yes. I was always yeah. uncomfortable with pauses and sign. Like if somebody sneezes in an elevator and you don't say God bless you right away, there's like that half a second, one second. And then two seconds you go, if I say it now, it's weird, right? <laughs> my whole life was that second, second. After God bless you, like, do I talk? Do I not talk? And then when I met my wife, it was no, man, you're you're okay, just exactly as you are. Sh- just shush. Yes. Which I still don't, but it's down. My friends will tell you, and Corey can attest, it's down probably ninety percent from what it was. I was a maniac. Hmm. But the the big thing with my wife is, uh, Monsignor Jim Lasante uh, said to me, I don't know how we even got onto it. But I, 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 it came out of nowhere. I go, you know, let me tell you something. You want to know what a happy marriage is? And he goes, what? I go, my wife picks up my phone and I don't care. There is not a yeah. single piece of data in that thing with billions of gigabytes, more of techno, 1% of that iPhone and 1% of this computer, this, this laptop. The guys that landed on the moon had half of 1% of that 1%. For real. <laughs> And when your wife opens up your computer and your wife goes, can I see your phone? If you got that one second, I'm like, Ugh, you're in yep. trouble. You're in trouble. Totally. Just I, honesty, 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 honesty. Absolutely. It's funny you say that because the first time I ever hung out with my wife, what we were early 20s and it, there was like a, we had gone through college together and been friends, but then she came and visited one time and there was like, a, oh my word, I think we're going to get married. With her but, midnight oil what, t-shirt on. She was all about midnight oil callbacks what buddy. Stru- <laughs> but exactly what struck me was i don't have to put on a show here yeah like i can totally be myself and she's fine with that and it was like this it was it was like a brand new it was what such is an extraordinary it, feeling rob what is it about every other human in our lives that we feel the need to dance and put on that show fill in we the space or yeah like, we yeah. don't know that we we don't even know we're yeah. doing it until we meet that person where we just rest like and somehow, bass. like deep like in your bones, you breathe deeper. You yeah, go, when you're a kid, you play tag and there's bass. You meet that person that's bass. Yeah. And yeah. you realize, oh, I've been running around the yard for 36 years. Yeah. Now it's I'm on bass. Yes, I can like, breathe. What, but I what can... is, like, how do we not know that we're even dancing all those times? It's weird, right? It's very weird. I just stumped you and you wrote the book. What's up? It's oh, scoreboard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you want to buy Zimzom on Amazon, uh, Rob Bell, this, this is the number one way people can help my podcast. Uh, go to jmore.com. You can really spend the day at jmore.com. Corey, you've done a fantastic job and uh, updating that Tumblr page. I went back and I watched that old James Addiction concert, uh, the one that changed me forever and hallucinogenic uh, stratosphere. Uh, uh, use my Amazon banner at jmore.com. Uh, like this guy, Tyler. Jay Moore, coming at you from Kentucky. I'm finally catching up on your podcast, and Jimmy Dore convinced me to click your Amazon banner and buy his book. Well, Tyler, I got a book for you. It's called Zim Zum. I That part I added. Uh, let's see here. If this makes it on air, I'd like to give a shout-out to my high school senior English teacher for championing all of these same issues. Thank you, Ron Smith. That's, I guess that's his teacher. And Jimmy Dore for setting the world straight. And to you, Jay Moore, for keeping my two-hour commute entertaining. Tyler, P.S., come do a show somewhere I can drive to. Well, bro, if you're in Kentucky, I was just in Cincinnati. Get with the program, bro. Uh, Tyler, thank you. The best way you all can help this podcast is by using the Amazon banner at jaymore.com. And Calgary, I'm coming to you March 19th, 20th, and 21st at the Laugh Stop, Laugh Stop in Calgary, Calgary date. Now. Rob Bell, you got some dates, and then people got to hold on to the seats because I got some questions for you about uh, Christ, the Christ. Uh, I think Pontius Pilate got a bit of a raw deal <laughs> historically. And uh, your thoughts on how, uh, how the evangelical world has completely, I think, lost their shit towards you. 
Uh, you're on tour with my very good friend, Pete Holmes, who I love very much. Now, the listener right now went, wait, what? Not that. No, yeah, Pete Holmes, the comic, our friend who's been on this podcast. Pete love Holmes. Love Pete Holmes. Pete Holmes uh, and you are actually on tour together, together at last. Yeah, it's we, sold out. We There's de- no reason well, we to even de- say it. We No, no, we haven't announced the next dates. We debuted oh, it. Oh, I thought you said... No, go ahead. We debuted it a couple weeks ago in Regent LA. At the Regent Theater. At the Regent, and then... Uh, sold out. Yeah, it did. It was fantastic. So who goes on first? We're together the whole time. What? Together at last. We, we go out together and we do the whole thing together. So I got to go out now with the guy that wrote, uh, like, what, the Four Agreements? Another <laughs> Oprah guy? <laughs> like, how, did, how does Pete land? It? Like, that's like stepping in lucky dog shit. I'm not, like, all of, like, a guy that's on Oprah, Super Soul Sunday, you have a mega church, you do your own thing, and then Pete's like, oh, yeah, I'm going out on the guy that was on Oprah. <laughs> I'll go out with, uh, you know... You know how it started? John, John Ru- it started with Miguel surfing Ruiz. together. I was on his podcast, and then at the end of his podcast, we were like, hey, do you want to be friends? Sure. Why don't you come surfing? Because I like go surfing a lot. So he comes down, and we start going surfing, and we're sitting out in the ocean talking. And at one point, we were like, we should do a show of talking about this stuff. And then we just made up like an hour and a half thing. Like It actually has like a structure. Like It has an outline. Like We take people places. But he, he's a comic. <laughs> You're yeah. a, a pastor. You're a communicator of the teachings of Christ. So how do you work your? I know his skill set. I know what he about that. <laughs> no, I know, but I know what his. I know what I know his wheelhouse. I know. Yeah. I know his batting stance. Yeah. So I'm confused. Not confused. I'm curious as to how Pete's like doing his bits. Like nice right. try, the devil, and like checking into like the bad motel with the bulletproof. Like what's your Wi-Fi? Stab me. What is? It? <laughs> and like all. And then like, do you have like like how does this work? Like he goes. So we each, we go back and forth. We have like a whole thing that we're doing. So we have an. Did you opening. sit down and write it together? Yes. Uh, and and there's pieces of it. See, I don't want to work that hard. I want a guy to go out and do like, look, I'm gonna. No, go we out. actually worked very hard on it. It yeah. actually has it actually has a flow to it. That's, I don't like working very hard, Rob. <laughs> I want to go out do about 45 minutes, and then a guy comes out after me does 45 minutes, and then at the end we like Martin and Lewis. We do huh? Oh, excuse me, Jerry. We just have a little goof off time and a Q and A, and then we all go home and get paid. I don't want to yeah. write something out long This is form. just like one click more organized than that. And oh. we're up there together. And it's fantastic. So these dates have not been announced yet, and they, but they will. I think maybe next week. We, I think we ne- do the first round of... Okay. I think there's going to be... Real Rob Bell is your Twitter, and your, uh, your website is what? Yeah. Uh, west, website's robbell.com. Instagram is something. Real Rob Bell. Real Rob Bell. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I was on that today. Uh, and Pete Holmes. You're going out on tour with Pete Holmes. And also, everything is spiritual. That's you solo? Yeah, that's coming up this year. Yeah. That's the world tour. That's a bus tour through the U.S. And then in uh, September, you're going to the United Kingdom. And then in November, you're going to take that bus somehow to Australia. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we'll hang out You'll with see there. a lot of sunken battleships <laughs> on your way over. Yeah. You're going to see the Lexington at the, at the Marianas Trench as you go by. A little history. All right. Let's talk why you, for some reason, you're a pastor, you have a mega church, you're in Michigan. First of all, what becomes a mega? At what point does church, big church? How many? What's the number of people? Right. Where people does all that like, stuff come from? He's the, he's got he's a guy. He's a mega church guy. It's not just a church. It's a mega church. I have right. no idea. I never understood any of that. But there's got to be some number in the yeah. press. Is Somebody mine. somewhere must have some number. But you were pre you were preaching to ten thousand people, right? Yeah. That's a big house, dude. I was twenty eight, and I was. I went to seminary to be like study to be a pastor. And then I went and worked in the church and I was sitting in that church thinking there's got to be a better way to do this. There's just got to be a better way to do this. So my what, wife what was it about friends, that church that was lagging that you thought needed a little kick in the rear end to get going? I, to me, like your spiritual life, redemption, grace, forgiveness. How do you get over betrayal? How do you forgive yourself for stuff you've done? This is the stuff everybody wants to talk about. Then how come that Sunday morning thing, it just wasn't that interesting, to be honest. There's no divine spark, as you said earlier. Well, I think a lot of people have had that experience. This should be like the most compelling thing ever. Yeah. This should be where we're talking about all the big questions and what what are we learning from science and what's it mean to forgive somebody who's wronged you and what about... How half the world lives on less than two American dollars a day. Like, how do we how do we even begin to wrap our minds around that? This should be, like, you know what I mean. This should yeah. be unbelievably on the edge of your seat. And how come, 
how do you, it almost takes more energy to make it boring. And I was actually, I'd been mentored by a really great pastor. And I just had this sense, like, there's got to be, I had some neighbors who had never, ever went to church. And I thought they would never come to this thing I'm doing here. They just, it would, there's too much, the length, they'd have to learn, when do I stand up? When do I sit down? What do I wear? I, I thought and it is boring. I mean, when you're a kid, your mom yeah. hands you the uh, tithing envelope and a pencil provided. And so like just so you sit so still. And it's thankful only, it's, for something to do. It's one hour. In hindsight, yeah. you go, wow, I was like, I thought I was there all day. Yeah. But church is boring. And I think with the new pope, who seems very progressive, and I think I go to St. Monica's, which is incredibly progressive. The sign above the door says all are welcome, and they mean it. I'll yeah. see Maria Shriver. I'll see gay men holding hands. I'll see about eight to a dozen homeless people. I'll see a crazy lady. I'm not, none of these are jokes. Yeah. With a baby carriage with a dog in it. Yeah. Yeah. Talking the entire time. And then you see like Conan O'Brien way over in the corner and you go, oh, all are, all are welcome. Yeah. And it's they mean wonderful. It. And the band kicks ass. Like they rock. And then Monsignor Torgerson comes out. And when he speaks, it's like he read my file all week and I don't know how he does it. I go back because there's no way he knows what happened to me this week every single time and he does. yeah and if there's a guest guy that comes in from like Kenya like well we're gonna hand it over to our guest uh, from our you know sister church in, in Kenya like that guy's been reading my file it freaks me out in a, <laughs> the best way possible yeah that's awesome but that's the first time I've been to a church St. Monica's in Santa Monica yeah. just n- uh, north of Wiltshire Boulevard close to the ocean where it's it's never dull ever, but I think that's fascinating that somebody was going to be a, a pastor, minister, priest, whichever were, and said, "This this should be more fun. This should be more exciting." That's exactly. So we literally this guy had built this building, and I can talk to him like, Would, "Can I use your building?" He's like, "It's got a big room at one end. Yeah, you can have it for a dollar a year." Literally went and found a building, and then. We just put out the word that we were starting something new, and then people started coming. It was completely crazy. I was 28. So what do you know when you're 28? So literally sort of making it up as we went along. Well, you knew this is what you knew. You knew the scriptures, and you knew what you wanted to convey, and you knew you wanted to spread the teachings of Christ, I would guess. So you had a really good playbook. Yeah. You knew that. Yeah, yeah. Getting, the, getting a guy to open up the building, that's like the what do you know at 28 part. But if yes. you've been to the seminary, you know the playbook. Yeah. You weren't going to go up there and like fart into the mic and go like, right, guys? Like, right. Come on, yeah, yeah. Wait till you see next week. <laughs> yeah, next week. Pete Holmes, ladies and gentlemen. And you know, I, I grew up, my parents would take us to church. And I, from early on, loved the Jesus stories. Like the idea that there was this whole religious establishment. And at every turn, he's like, seriously, you guys are missing it. And the fact that everybody who's been pushed to the edges, who's been stepped on, who's been forgotten he like welcomes them he embraces them he keeps insisting there's a whole nother way to see the world that the world loves to rank things this way but there's an upside down rank like i love those stories okay they I'm, always I'm glad, moved me i'm glad you said that because one of the biggest things you take flack for and john shelby spong who we spoke about off mic who is a hero of mine literary uh, the reason I'm Bible read is because of his book, Res- Rescuing the Bible from Fundamentalism. Yeah. Because he would say, well, if you're going to interpret the Bible, he, John Shelby Spong, for, not for you, for the listener, uh, was the Archbishop of the Episcopalian Church in Newark, and he very, well, very openly welcomed gays and lesbians into his church, and they tried to have him defrocked. Right. And he said, well, it's, I mean, Christ-like. I'm welcome. Anybody wants to worship Christ. And they would quote that sentence or two, five, whatever sentences in the Bible about uh, man ought not lay down with another man. And then John Shelby Spong, this isn't a lefty from Cal who's like a theolog- theolog- uh, professor. This was the archbishop of the Episcopalian Church saying, all right, well, then that means I, I'm going to hell because I had a shrimp cocktail last week because in Leviticus, you can't have shellfish. Right. If you touch a woman while she's on her period, you have to have your testicles crushed in public. <laughs> Lot had sex with both of his daughters when they fled Sodom and Gomorrah. And it said in the book, parentheses, Genesis, whatever the passage was. And I remember being in San Francisco, going to the bookstore, buying a Bible and going, he did lay down with his daughter. Really, they got really him drunk. They got him yeah. drunk and they took advantage of him yeah. to populate an entire city yeah. of uh, most, if we're, if we're playing science, Down syndrome children 
Like this, this doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. So John Shelby Spong was the first guy to hit me over the head with the whole, well, hold on a minute. Well, let's, let's welcome everybody in. And then St. Monica's, like I said, the, the sign above the door is all are welcome. But you are now under fire with the evangelicals uh, because of your willingness and openness to the gay community and your pushback of trying to, and correct me if I'm wrong in what I'm about to say, I'm paraphrasing. I, I, I feel like, I just tweeted before you came on. My mother told me when I was a little boy, because I was scared of hell. They scared me. Yeah. And she used to, I, mean, I can see her back. I have a Jean Ferguson Moore making okra and some weird stuff and some house in Jersey just going, how, she would stop, look at me and said, how could a loving God right. send you? She would point to me. Right. Not Hitler, not Pol Pot, JJ. How could a loving God send you to hell? Now, I think Rob Bell, you now, I think, have hit this existential wall as a pastor that in the Bible, we're all roiling in this uh, sea of fire. And that includes, uh, if you believe the Bible literally, Muslims, Jews, because they're not down with the New Testament. They don't believe in Christ, the Son of God. Native Americans, anybody born before 7 AD, because he wasn't born at zero. Right, are you with me? <laughs> yes. Every Buddhist, every Hindu, everyone's drowning in this sea of fire because they haven't received the message of Christ. That I've always had a problem with. Right. And right. you sort of kind of stepped away from your brethren, from that from that crew, that evangelical mega church folk, <laughs> yeah. and kind of started talking to Oprah with this sort of mini crisis in your head, but you turned it around and you made a very positive message from it. I you know, I didn't I didn't buy that from the beginning this this idea the tweets are already flying in how you and i are going to hell because it says like that's all they okay i'll do an interview with the this. okay please first off stop the word sending hell, me scripture first off the, the word hell i know it is used roughly 12 times in the entire bible so first off in the hebrew scriptures the old testament they didn't really have a conception of of the afterlife because remember if you're a good jew your story begins with the exodus out of Egypt. And the Egyptians were building stuff and burying people with coins. You're like, whatever that, that afterlife stuff is, that's crazy. That's Indiana Jones, man. Right, exactly. So Old Testament, uh, murder and real estate. So you have in the Psalms, you have a couple mentions of Sheol and the grave. So vague ideas that apparently so-and-so died, so they're not here. But beyond that, you have almost nothing in terms of an articulated belief about what happens when you die. Um, and, uh, my neighbor, lovely Jewish woman, a couple years ago died. I go to the funeral and there's nothing in the service about where she is now. It's, she was a good woman. She loved her neighbors. She cared for her kids. So why have the evangel So okay, go ahead. then you get to Jesus times. Jesus uses the word hell roughly 12 times. He's the only one. I think there's one other mention. Otherwise he's the only person who used the word hell. The word he uses is the Greek word in the gospels, Gehenna, G E. H-E-N-N-A, Gehenna. It means Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom was an actual valley in Jerusalem in the first century. It was the south wall of the city of Jerusalem. It's where people tossed their trash. And there was a fire going there to burn the trash. And there were animals that fought over little scraps of food in the trash. And when they would fight, their teeth would clash and you'd have a gnashing sound. So... The only use of the word hell in the New Testament is a word that referred to an actual physical town dump where things were sort of endlessly smoldering or burning up, etc. So Why that whole, are you the first Christian <laughs> oh, I'm to not. say this it's out loud? It's all over the... Oh, I've you can find whole it. traditions on this. You can find church fathers... In the 300s, all right, well, 400s. I, probably not going to meet those guys. Yeah, I'm talking you about can find modern writings, day people that but are... But early, early church history, there are lots of church fathers that said, if Jesus isn't the Savior of all, how could he save anybody? Their assumption was God wins everybody in the end, ends up in a beautiful place together. And it's your translation of the word God, which I've always... I made, yes. I made peace with early, the, the word love and God are interchangeable. Absolutely. And the Beatles. So in the end. I think your question, you have a whole giant mega industrial religious system 
that's out of touch with its own tradition that had this very wide, inclusive, generous sort of understanding of, you know, who am I to judge that person from that faith or that background? Is there money in the judgment? <laughs> Is that why they... Well, if you they did people... turn. You are an outcast now to these multi, multi-millionaire preachers, sure. which if... I mean, in the book of John, Jesus didn't kick the money changing tables over <laughs> because he wasn't getting his cut. Right, 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 right. It wasn't like, wait, you're well, selling merch? 80 20 split, bro? <laughs> you're selling my dad's shirts? You mother. He just starts kicking over the merch table. <laughs> He's the original frontman. He goes out yes. to the Beacon yes. Theater. Well, yes. you guys are selling merch? Come my on. I'm going to tear this whole theater down and build it back in three days. It'll be the best Beacon Theater. All right. Uh, <laughs> So these preachers that have turned their backs on you, which, uh, and very openly writing, ma there's many articles, and you now are uh, a hippy dippy. You've just really? you all. I never Google my name. This is fascinating. Really? I don't. I don't. Yeah, I don't read any of this stuff. All right, Sarah Pulliam Bailey. You know who this lady is? Uh, writer. She's like a, a, she seemed a little obsessed with you going off the reservation of evangelical uh, theology. <laughs> Quote, the Chicago Sun-Times wondered aloud. First of all, Sarah Pulliam Bailey, a newspaper cannot wonder aloud right. because it's printed. So already, uh, squirt word, Rob Bell. <laughs> That's what she wrote. The Chicago Sun-Times wondered aloud. Whether the Michigan mega church pastor could be the next Billy Graham. Then he went to hell. <laughs> Is that really what it says? Yes. He does not attend an organized church anymore. Instead, he surfs the waves near Hollywood and has teamed up with the goddess of pop theology, Oprah Winfrey, close quote. This is like, you should go your name. No way. But you're like, screw that, man. <laughs> I'm like already the, bored. Like the, you were the next Billy Graham. You were the guy. You sat down with Oprah. All hell broke loose because Oprah takes in all different people. Oprah has a spiritual thing. It, it seems like evangelicals loathe the word spiritual. Right. Because it's this written text or you're out, which I don't enjoy. Right. And that's why anybody that tells me, John 3, 16, though, you know, uh, if you believe in Christ as the Son of God, you have everlasting life, I'm paraphrasing, I always want to go, you know, if you go back two sentences, Son of Man is capitalized, which means my Son of Man, of me and my Father, where God is, that's namaste. I respect the divinity that's within you. He's, you know, Moses, what is it? No, no one has ever uh, gone into heaven except he who came from heaven, the Son of Man, capitalized, same as him, meaning Christ, Son of Man. There's, there's a God, that divine spark that you were talking about. Yeah. That's what I got down with, and I get accused, like I do interviews on like the Blaze in these Christian sites, because why not? It's, I, I, I love to talk about my faith. And then you read those comments underneath, like, you're a cafeteria Catholic. You bet your ass. I don't believe Jonah lived in a whale's ass. That's crazy talk. I'm pretty sure a guy named Jonah didn't live in a whale's belly. Yeah. I mean, I. that's me. Do you know what that story's about, by the way? You know what I think it's about? Break it down. Okay. The Assyrians were the nastiest, some of the nastiest neighbors Israel had. Just brutally beat on them year after year after year after year. I mean, Israel's had a tough hustle from day yes. one. Jesus. So when this story opens and a dude named Jonah is told, go to Nineveh and bless them, Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. So when Jonah gets in a boat and goes the other direction, I think the original audience of that story would have been like, you go, dude. Because nobody would have gone to Nineveh. That is the Enemy worst. Territory. They have they have so brutally degraded us 
and so they sent the him most... into like uh, uh, you know an so when it's gangs, like go to your you go to Nineveh, your crip, go talk to the absolutely bloods. okay. I think the because nowadays a modern sort of sort of safe anesthetized audience reads that and goes, oh, Jonah is so disobedient, he's not doing what God wanted. I think the crowd would have been like, you you go boy, because uh, they would have all been cheering him on. I think because I would never, no way would you go to Nineveh. So. He goes there, and he goes the other direction, and there's this story about the whale. I think the story is a story about can you forgive and bless your worst enemy? They have made your life a living hell. Can you move? Can you let the past be the past, and can you move towards them like in the love whale and blessing? moved you through his bowels? If you believe in that sort of thing, but I think it's such a more powerful story. But do you see than, what you're doing? You're interpreting. And absolutely, everybody is. But. But they're not. Exactly. They're not admitting they are. The people that are arguing with the Rob Bells of the world, with the John Shelby Spongs of the world, are not interpreting any of the gospel. I'll I'll just go New Testament. Okay. Because I'm not versed in Old Testament at all. I mean, I am, but I'm not. Uh, Why is the Bible so... How do I put this? It's a document. It was written... I learned from, again, John Shelby Spong's book, which is not Zimzom, which you should be ordering in the Amazon banner at jmore.com. <laughs> if you want to get married and have a nice... And there's uh, Velvet Elvis. You've written tons of books that have been wildly successful. Um, if we started writing about the Revolutionary War tonight... Yeah. Write it out by hand. What happened? When did the Brit... How... That's how long from the stories of Christ to when it actually got put down through word of mouth. Roughly. Roughly. A couple hundred years, right? Uh, some would argue some would argue probably fifty years at least. Oh, fifty. Yeah, fifty at least. I think you might want to talk to John Shelby Spong about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, he's talking about as it's it's like fully circulating and it's collected as we know it in right. sort of that. But yeah, but why are evangelicals and why are born again Christians? I love Dennis Miller's joke when he goes, "How about these born again Christians? Forgive me for getting the shit right the first time, right? <laughs> How many times can you pull this off? Can you be born again and again like some kind of evangelical Gabor sister? <laughs> why are evangelicals and born again Christians? Why under any message board and anything, yeah. any mention of the Bible, this discussion we're having right now is going to be inundated with three sentences at a time from this three, and then they're going to start arguing with one another. Somebody's going to come it's in and say, pretty. "Hey, it's a nice podcast. Why can't we all just ha- enjoy?" Right. It? And then they're going to pile on that because the word says. You know, what I think their problem is. I think their problem is five hundred years old. 500 years ago, you have this Protestant Reformation, and I always say, and they're still protesting. 500 years ago, you have this Protestant Reformation, and the big word so that what comes, does that mean? You have a revolt against the, uh, a Reformation against the Catholic Church, Martin okay. Luther, and one of the big tenets is sola scriptura, is the Latin, which means scripture alone. We don't, we have the Bible, and the problem is You have people going, it's just what the word says, it's just what the word says. But if you look in history, people of faith always read the scriptures, and then they also held it in tension with reason, with tradition, with a sense of the movement of the spirit, maybe doing something new. You know what I mean? It was always it was always read like within like a matrix or within like a a tension of other things. You also engage your brain. You also Think about, well, what have other people said along the way? And so what you're pointing to is people just go, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. Yeah. But we, we've advanced. We've progressed. We've, something new is in the air. We can What is that new thing fresh. that's in the air? Well, here's a, I actually see the Bible as a library of really progressive books. Here's why. Like... Let's think of the most primitive, barbaric passage. That is one of those passages that people use that say, why would you ever do this? Um, Old Testament, Book of Deuteronomy, there's a passage that says, if you ever go into battle and you crush your enemy, you can take any of the women that you like home with you and make them your own. It's the kind of passage someone reads and just goes, see, this is everything that's wrong with religion. You can bring her home. Before you bring her home, you've got to have her shave her head, 
and then you can make her your wife if you want to, if she pleases you. But if she doesn't please you, then you have to write up a certificate and you can send her away. Now, anybody in 2015 reading that, it's like, it's got like 20, it's so primitive, so barbaric. You know what and I mean? And you're not, none of us are going into battle. Exactly. So it's not only a that historic serve our setting that yeah. we can't even barely relate to, but then there's so many things where we're like, well, these are like, one, real quickly, I, men and women that serve our country obviously going into battle. Right. I meant guys like you. Yeah, and yeah, I, right, right, right. Okay. Sitting in your garage on a yeah, Friday yeah, night. Yeah. It's not like we're like, you know what? Santa Monica, kiss our ass. <laughs> Down the hill. There we go with our two swords. Yeah. Now, what's fascinating is in the ancient Near East at that time, there were rules about what are called the spoils of war. And when you went into battle and you crushed somebody, you could take anything of theirs from animals to possessions to their wives and do whatever you wanted with them. So when you read that passage and it seems so barbaric, it actually is giving the woman some rights. And you actually had to give her a certificate of divorce, which means... She had some dignity if she left you. Lawyers, even then. Exactly. Ugh. So what's re- so what's really interesting? It's easy to get lost. Sort <laughs> if of. You're a lawyer listening. Turn yeah. it. I don't want you. <laughs> but what's fascinating is this passage that we all read and go, "Oh my word, that's so backwards." At that time, was actually a step forward. It was progressive. It was actually you were giving progressive. Women many rights. So if you read this book in the context, in the moments of history in which these people were actually telling their stories, what you see beneath it is like an arc or a trajectory moving everything forward. But you said present tense. So You were talking about a movement and a change now. So what I and think... I said what's changing. My question is, is the same thing that was moving people forward into greater inclusion, greater love, greater compassion, I think that same spirit is alive and well today inviting us all to treat each other more humanly, to be more compassionate. And so if you take this book and you keep quoting it, you know what I mean? You keep taking verses and pulling them out without reading them as the story, the unfolding story that they're a part of, you might be using a really a passage that was really progressive for its time to actually defend backwards beliefs. <laughs> are you with me? I am with you. And that's the thing you see now is people... There's even technical language for this that scholars use, but I see people going, yeah, but the Bible says, and I always go, where does it say that? What's going on? Who was writing it? What was the time period? You may be dragging us backward to a passage that was actually helping people move forward at the time. Here's, Which is a really long answer, but I like talking about it. No, it's, <laughs> believe me, I talk far too much, so I, I, I'm glad you're, uh, <laughs> you're, you're speaking more. And I, I'm, I'm glad the way you're framing this for me and for the listener um, because I've always been obsessed with science versus scripture. And in the books that I've read from men of the cloth, again, I can't emphasize this to the listener enough. Yeah. I'm not like reading, you know, uh, you know, a Pepperdine professor that is an agnostic going, well, no, I'm priests and I have had discussions if the flood happened 40 days, 40 nights, and it was a mile, I don't know how in the Bible, above the highest peak. Oh, right, right. You're talking of Mount Everest, a mile above that. Certainly today, science would say, hey, there's water on the moon. Yeah. Or some, I'm completely making a third grade version of this. Do you know, does, uh, is what I'm saying? Okay, so science, you know, uh, 